no operation led by outsiders can substitute for the will of the people of the country. Simply cannot. I think one of the first things that anyone going to any context should do is, I mean, really be an anthropologist, try and understand um, the history, the culture, the institutions, the organizations of that particular place. Every place has a long history. They have ways of organizing themselves to produce food and trade food. They have ways of building and repairing buildings. Um, they have ways of educating each other, of settling disputes, um, just of organizing daily and communal life. They have to be aware of so many things. First, of course, uh, know about uh, the country, the context in which they are operating, which, of course, uh, requires a lot of consulting, listening, reading, you know, getting the right advice. Pre-deployment planning is critical, um, and it's important that it be done together. If it's a big disaster, a lot of new actors show up very, very quickly, and not just the operational actors, say, like militaries who come in to help with a relief effort, but also the political actors. So within the humanitarian space, there is a coordination system there that exists run by the Office of Coordination for Humanitarian Affairs, OCHA, the part of the United Nations. OCHA has a very good, what they call a cluster system, uh, to help manage on the humanitarian side. So food, nutrition, housing, water, health, sanitation, all that stuff. Coordinating horizontally across those groups, the traditional aid community, those uh, new actors like military police and also some bilateral aid agencies who, are, who want to play a big role. And then the politics is complicated. And then kind of the folks who are doing the real work in the trenches, the muddy boots. It's a very complicated coordination space. The more that you can get a handle on what's going on and who's doing what and what somebody's motivation or mission is, then I think it's easy to understand why somebody is acting in a certain way and therefore able to coordinate, cooperate and work with that counterpart. If you take that mindset, you will build interagency solutions inherently into your force and your people will be thinking ahead of you about how to resolve issues that complement the team not one aspect or element of the team. And I think that the leader demonstrating a commitment to working in an interagency environment is implicitly driving that philosophy through the organisation that they lead. The most important, the coordination. But you can't coordinate uh, agencies that cannot interoperate. That means initially you must create that interoperability capability and through exercising. You need to be prepared. Uh, and how are you prepared? In many ways, you need to practice before you do. It's a very difficult thing to do. In fact, the nature of our professional careers makes it very difficult to practice, particularly for operational roles. That's where we think that involving people in exercise programs is increasingly important. Training and education really important at the leadership level, you know, at the mid-level leadership, company commander, brigade commander, because they set the tone. I mean, they set the tone as the whole team is going over there as to what they're, what, how they're going to, to in interact. It's very important as an individual that you know, where do I operate the best and where does my skill set rest? And some people do have the span of ability to be able to work across all of those facets from high ambiguity, high response, quick decision making, um, through to very structured and organised approach in having the fundamentals in place and building on those fundamentals. What capacities and competences do they bring to the table? And then what role are they going to play? The leader must understand. Where do they fit in? It's like a wheel. Where in the wheel do they fit? so that the wheel runs smoothly. Culture is incredibly important. The sort of culture I like is a people culture, a people culture defined by, uh, by values, 
one which really emphasises uh, teamwork and collaboration. But what would be my advice if I walked into any country? I think my advice would be as follows. First and foremost, be humble. Do not assume that as SRSG you know everything. Leaders, until they are humble and willing to learn, willing to listen, they cannot be good leaders. In fact, uh, I think uh, listening leaders are more important than talkative leaders. As a leader coming in, whether you have the experience or you don't have the experience, it's critical when you first step in to realize that uh, you are, you're not in charge, you're there to support somebody, uh, that their needs, they'll help to articulate those to you. And sometimes it's difficult not to be in charge, but eh, a little bit of humility, a little bit of realization, of, and a lot of, uh, a lot of training and a lot of change has taken place. I have great optimism for this because I've seen 20 years of change in this area. There is a huge number of people and organizations and agencies and military and uh, different disaster management authorities who are there at the time of the crises. But then when it really comes to a point at which it's time to, to use the phrase that we often use of building back better, uh, they're not necessarily there. And it's in that period where we really can get ready for uh, the next event. And if we get ready properly, the next event might not be a disaster.